We're going to be trying to use Dart to uh, handle tens or hopefully hundreds of thousands of simultaneous socket connections. So we looked at it with uh, Node.js, Dart, Java. You can make a C you know, server that uses ePoll directly. Um, so Dart was better than Node, but it wasn't better than uh, Java or C by a long shot. And I was curious if anybody on the team is looking at this problem to make a super scalable server. So okay. one quick, did everyone hear that or do we need to repeat? Okay, cool, go ahead. Who would like to answer? I didn't hear I the question. I'm not oh, being I didn't ask up. my panelists if I heard it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you repeat and speak right into it, yeah. I mean, yeah, basically it's, uh, we want 100,000 simultaneous socket connections to a Dart server and we want it to scale well. Um, as within, you know, a factor of two or okay. three from what we would get with C and ePoll. Is, that, is there anybody looking at that? I know we have been looking at it with the server team. Um, probably should reach you with uh, Soren after, after the break here, but okay. we've had ideas on scaling with isolates and basically handing off requests to isolates. Um, I mean, so it, can, it could be the same isolate. We, we basically, you know, I, th I think what we probably, I've only looked at this problem very briefly, I'll admit, but when I looked at it, I wanted to see where, I mean, in Java you have NIO, which kind of you can see how that maps to ePoll on a Linux system. I, you know, other operating systems have something like ePoll. Um, <coughs> what does that interface look like in Dart? There doesn't seem to be, it's very, very deep, kind of buried in uh, lots of sinks and so forth. Um, so, like, is that maybe something that can be exposed at a lower level to a Dart programmer? So if you use the raw socket API, then you get, uh, then you get essentially what the ePoll is okay. behind the scenes. So that's how, that's how it works behind the scenes. Um, I don't know how much of the streams and so on add as an overhead. That's something that we should probably measure. Okay. But there is a raw socket that you could use that is a, a little bit uh, more low level if you're looking forward to that. Okay. I just want to add that a good start is to send us a benchmark. Okay, so we yeah, see we can what do the that. problem is. All right. Who who do we send that to? Or can I talk to you later, maybe? Yes, yeah, okay. so just uh, file a bug. File yeah. a bug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With a benchmark attached. Cool. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, and please keep continue to queue up. Uh, welcome to the panel. Again, we've had a lot of great opportunity to talk to various different engineers here, and we hope to continue that. We're here for you, so ask us questions. Um, but we also asked online with our moderator here, so we've queued up a lot of questions here. We want to talk to you, and to kick it off, I hope we can introduce our panelists. So I could do it, but it'd be a lot more interesting if they can introduce themselves, so we can learn who they are, what makes them tick. So Lars, <laughs> can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Lars Bach. I barely tick. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> One of the founders of Dart uh, has been working on virtual machines the last uh, 30 years. So um, I care about performance, I care about predictable performance, I care about making uh, pro um, programs pro productive. That's it. Yeah, and my name is Casper uh, Lund, uh, and I've been working with Lars for the last 15 years doing various different virtual machine implementations, <coughs> and uh, the latest project here is the Dart project that uh, I, I co-founded. So. Right now, I'm working on the um, on uh, providing a good runtime system for iOS and uh, and on investigating what we can do to make isolates uh, a lot easier to to use. My name is Dan Rebel. I work on the uh, Analyzer team. I care about uh, making sure that Dart is easy and understandable, that the tooling is fast and uh, provides useful information to the user, so that uh, to to increase the productivity. Uh, I'm Ivan Postova. I'm the lead for the VM team. Um, what I care about is making sure that the Dart VM is applicable on the tiniest devices, as you'll see this afternoon, two services on uh, running on App Engine and uh, massive servers. So basically being able to uh, be elastic between uh, those two extremes uh, with the VM is what I really care about. And I'm Dan Grove. I work on the Dart for Web team. and. Obviously, I care about Dart for the web and making web developers really productive. 
And my name is Seth Ladd. I'm a product manager on Dart. And just because I'm on the Dart team doesn't mean I'm not going to be sending the hard-hitting questions to our panelists, like, can Lars microwave a burrito so hot even he can't eat it? I'm going to let that sink in for a second. And Dart, great language or greatest language? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, OK, cool. So let's turn it back to questions. Yes, you have a question for our panel. Uh, yes, if you got a um, uh, get out of feature card, what feature would you like to remove from Dart? Just one feature for each of the members, please. <laughs> cool, okay. <laughs> are, we still, are we still live streaming? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I can take one, it's just my personal one. Um, uh, we uh, took some features from JavaScript and moved that into Dart, uh, so it's easy to move from JavaScript uh, to Dart. Uh, one thing I don't like is the uh, implicit extraction of closures. I actually would like to have that explicit, so I can see in the code if you extract a closure. Because often, if you forget to put in parentheses, right, you, you take out a closure. Um, I want that to be a bug. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I can go. Um, I think one thing that would be very interesting to try to remove from that is, uh, is all the asynchrony. It's a little bit controversial, but it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a thing that, that would be fun to see how far we can take something that isn't asynchronous. Uh, clearly, there's a need for asynchronous uh, operations, but it would be fun to take the, but the idea. What would you put back? That feels uh, like you're taking something away. Yeah, asynchronous. OK. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Casper is fully aware of that they'll not work in the browser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dan. Start for the web. <laughs> Big nums. <laughs> Those of us that work in the web, but like, you know, not really an option. Cool. Thank you for the question. Let's go to the first uh, highest voted question here in our moderator. And I think we touched a little bit about this, but it'd, it'd be nice to get, get the answer uh, for the stream. Uh, with the Dart VM not going in Chrome anymore, what kinds of JavaScript interop improvements are we planning? For example, will we be able to write functions or Polymer elements in Dart, compile in the JS, and distribute them as JS libraries? So um, yeah, very, lots of JS improvements. Yes, yes, and yes. Nice. Um, <laughs> the, the short answer. <laughs> but, um, and we talked about this some yesterday. Jacob Richmond also hit this in his lightning talk. For those of you that were here, we're doing a ton of improvements to JS Interrupt to make it feel really natural. And I showed an example of this in Kevin's and my talk yesterday. It's going gonna, it's gonna to actually feel very good. As long as you're calling into something that exposes a you know, sort of Dartish um, interface to the outside world, it's going to feel very natural, and you're going to be able to get all the tooling support that you're used to, so code completion, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Thanks. And yes, all the other all the other questions are yes. You will be able to write functions in Dart and compile and distribute them to JS developers. Great. Again, if there's any live questions, please queue up. We'll go to the next question here. Is it possible for the Dart VM to match the JVM's performance on numeric computational yes. heavy benchmark? Yep. Okay. Good. <laughs> Did you want to finish <laughs> <laughs> on Box TV? So maybe we can talk a little bit. We did something with Box TV recently, and what's your perspective on the question? So. Specifically on numeric computations, we have a couple benchmarks that are not Box2D. Box2D is a kind of a special case where we, um, our internal benchmark harness, I don't think we share those numbers externally because of um, licensing issues. But um, there is some fluid motion simulation and stuff like that where we are essentially equal or on parity uh, with, uh, with the Java VM. For Box2D, it's a little bit harder because there are many different implementations of Box2D, and the surgeon on my team, he's somewhere in the audience, um, just recently rewrote the Dart version of Box2D based on the Java version, and uh, the results are quite impressive from the, both Dart2JS and the VM significantly improved on, on that, and I think the numbers that he quoted me were like, um, around four milliseconds per frame on a Java VM, and about five and a bit milliseconds per frame on, on the Dart VM. And I, I hope we can basically get more stuff going there. 
the Dart VM is much more, much younger than uh, than Hotspot or any of the JVMs that are out there. So yeah. we hope to catch up. But the type feedback that we get at runtime makes up for most of the or all of the static feedback that you can get. Yes, I have a meta comment. So um, I'm pretty sure the JVM uh, JVM is doing a good job because in Java you can do inlining or you basically have basic types. In the Dart VM, it's more complicated because, right, you have to often, or sometimes if you're not inline everything, you have to sort of materialize uh, results in a heap. Um, so it varies with benchmarks how fast we can get compared to the JVM. Now, uh, the question is, is Box2D a real problem for you Dart developers? <laughs> <laughs> Um, because, you know, when it comes to benchmarks, we can always improve it uh, by just throwing resource at it. But does it matter? Um, in the presentation I've seen the last one and a half days, I have not seen that to be an issue. Uh, I'm more concerned about getting performance of factored code uh, for these, these kinds of applications you're writing. Um, so um, we can get it as fast as, as you want, but the question is whether we want to spend the resources doing so. But this question was specifically about numeric computation, right? Yeah. On, on factor code, if it's a lot of virtual calls and so on, we're actually at the speed of a hotspot and sometimes even better. Yeah. So, and I think there's a question about this a little bit later, but it segues in perfectly from here. And it's something that we talk to a lot of developers about. Maybe we can sort of get on record and discuss this. Um, I talk to a lot of developers who say, Dart's dynamically typed, you can use var a lot, so it has to be slower than statically typed languages. So can you explain a little bit from the VM engineering perspective or the language design perspective where the intersection is for type annotations, how we use them, how we don't, and how, what, what are the impacts of that for performance, if there are any? Is that That's a question of me? Uh, okay. The panel? Yeah. Well, for, for the VM specifically, uh, whether you type your variables or not doesn't matter at all. So basically the first thing we do when we parse it, unless you run in check mode, we throw them away. Right. They, they don't, they we're not concerned about them because we, based on the language spec, we cannot use them at all. Right? We have to send dynamically whatever the, the, the selector was. So what we do collect is as you keep running, we collect what are the types that you're actually seeing here dynamically and make optimizations based on that. And that basically gives us the exact types that are, that the exact subtypes potentially that are being used here to, to dispatch versus in a, if you do static typing, it would be basically, okay, you're calling this function on, a, on one of the subclasses that is, that is uh, being passed here or could be passed here. And for us, since we collect all the information, right, we know it exactly, oh, in this case, it's only going to be this subclass and, and we optimize for that. And we have to back out if we made a misprediction. An extra comment here is that uh, uh, the type annotation you see in Dart programs, the interface types, they're not implementation types, so they don't work really well for, for the VM anyways. You need the actual implementation types in order to do the, the proper inlining. So um, yeah, it works well. Works well. And I think if you, even if you look at, uh, at working machines like the JVMs, uh, if you go back in time, when they got the big boost in performance, it was based on dynamically analyzing what was going on at runtime, not by doing a head of time compilation or basing it on the types of the program. So uh, we're just taking in the, in the Dart VM to the next level where everything is dynamic, but we can certainly get the same uh, kind of benefits. Yep. Great, thank you. Question. Hi. Uh, I really love what the Dart team does for like making the tooling perfect. And from my point of view, there's like one kind of little step uh, which is left, which would be super cool to have, which is, so is there any plans on implementing hot swapping of the code in the VM? <laughs> I understand this is a super complex problem. <laughs> so, I mean, we are certainly looking into um, interactive or live programming where you can change the code as it's executing. Uh, it's something that actually would work pretty well in the VM too, I think, uh, with the very dynamic approach the VM takes to things. It's also something we think that like, uh, has a real uh, shot at making a big difference in a mobile setting where the tool chains are a little bit heavier and where the ability to update code while it's running on uh, your smartphone without having to recompile it would be pretty powerful. So it, I think it's, uh, it's in the cards for us to, uh, to explore that in the, in the coming months and, and have a good solution for that. 
Ooh, can't wait. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Let's go back to the moderator. And I think this touches on some of the conversation I've had online or in person here about Dart Editor. So this question is phrased as, are there any improvements to the Dart Editor coming with regard to working with other JavaScript libraries like code completion with JavaScript? But I think it's also a good time for us to address the various different tooling options we have and what is the strategy for Dart tooling and what editors do we recommend and will continue to support. We're moving away from Dart Editor. Dart Editor was designed initially to serve uh, two masters, and that's a problem. One, you have an uh, early adopter who's learning Dart, who's literally just getting started, and you want to you want to provide a really easy on ramp. The other uh, audience you want to try to serve are the power developers who are building big apps and want all of the power at, at their fingertips. It is really difficult to serve those two needs simultaneously with the same product. It was a conscious decision to separate those two. DartPad, as you heard earlier, uh, is focused entirely on lowering the barrier completely to almost zero to get people started. You can try out things. It's low friction, low resistance. Um, you can share it. You can put things in Stack Overflow, put references, etc. That serves one purpose. The other goal is to provide rich experience in tools that, that uh, developers are already familiar with, WebStorm being the primary one. Um, but that's not alone. It, the WebStorm is our primary focus. But secondarily, would be continue to take that same uh, infrastructure that we have for Dart Editor and put it into Eclipse. So you have Eclipse, uh, Sublime, which there already exists a plugin for that. Um, VI, Emacs are interest, uh, we don't have anything there yet, but they're of interest. So the key is to provide the analysis, the infrastructure, um, where the developers are. Yeah, and just, just to go back to the original question here about, um, about JavaScript libraries, one of the things that we showed yesterday is that we're working on some stub generation um, given TypeScript definition files, and that will make it much easier. That'll fit right into all the analysis services that are out there. Great, thank you. Don, question. All right. So, um, you know, one of the things we haven't really talked about too much during the summit is, uh, you know, what the roadmap is for Polymer Darts. Uh, obviously, Polymer JS has the 0 0.8, and there are a number of performance improvements. And additionally, at this time, you can actually share your elements with other people unless they're already using uh, the Dart ecosystem. Yeah. So, what's the game plan here? Well, I, the game plan has a couple of different pieces. One is we're waiting for the Polymer team to reach a point of stability with Polymer, which sounds like it's coming pretty soon, according to things I've heard recently. So we're, we're not going to do this kind of following around um, Polymer change by change. But as Polymer reaches 1.0, we are going to provide Polymer Dart 1.0. Second angle on this is what we talked about some with DevCompiler and JS Interop yesterday, which is the ability to take Dart libraries and ship them to JavaScript developers, or Dart developers for that matter, and we don't really want to care who, who the consumer of components is. So that's coming. So with the combo of Polymer reaching stability and dev compiler, I, I think we'll actually be able to do the thing that you want to do, which is shipping Polymer components and not caring who your consumers are. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So I like this question. So if Fletch and Sky succeeds as experiments, what are the next plan? But what did the outcome counts as succeeded? Well, it's um, it's hard for us to speak to the uh, to the uh, plans for the Sky project. You should have come to the presentation at five o'clock and, and and see what that is and ask questions afterwards. But in terms of Fletch, um, there's a very non-experimental part of Fletch, which which is this uh, runtime system for iOS, and we we showed in the keynote yesterday that we're going to ship that this year as a as a product you can you can use to ship mobile apps for, uh, for iOS on top of. Um, there are experimental things in Fletch as well. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the isolate work that we started. And, and clearly, if we find that that is so compelling that people actually want to and need to use it, uh, we will find a way of making that non-experimental and putting it into our, our product offerings. So um, a success for us would be people uh, being able to actually use this to build something truly fantastic on top of, making isolates a lot easier to use. So I, I think... Um, that yeah, developers are more productive, developers are happy with this, and developers are taking it to build really cool things. That, that's success to me. Cool. Okay. This is a good one here. So what kind of performance differences are expected between Fletch Interpreter, 
JVM's JIT, Dart to JS on the JavaScript VM. Uh, how will Fletch perform relative to using iOS's built-in JavaScript JIT? So there's a lot in there, but maybe we can talk about the different fundamental ways we approach the compilation and running, and what are the trade-offs for these different environments? Uh, that's probably for me as well. Um, so the Fletch system is a very simple system designed to run really well in an iOS context where you cannot do any just-in-time compilation. So we do uh, bytecode interpre interpretation there, and that's sort of inherently slower than doing just-in-time compilation. Um, we're focusing on actually delivering something you can use to build real apps there, and later today I'll show something running on an iPad so you can sort of see for yourself that it's fast enough, at least for certain things. But it's going to be really hard for us to like, compare the performance between all these things. It really depends on what you're, what you're running. For certain micro benchmarks, using an interpreter is a lot slower than having a real JIT, but for other things it's probably fine for writing real applications. So it's, it's a really difficult question to, to answer. Um, the nice thing is that we all like, dream about making performance faster, and that, that's really what we, we like to do. So uh, we have a strong background in that, so I, we expect to be able to improve Fletch a lot on the uh, performance side as well. So one comment about uh, iOS is that uh, you're not allowed to generate code uh, inside an iOS app. So the question about how will Flash perform compared to the built-in JavaScript JIT, uh, it'll be slower because we cannot generate code on the fly. Um, that's just how it is. We didn't make the rules for, for that system. Um, however, uh, we also know how to make interpretation fast. And uh, you can actually do some pre-compilation. You can do profiling of the application and bundle pre-compiled code with the app if that turns out to be useful. And we'll certainly be looking at these options moving forward. Yvonne, can you talk a little bit about what the VM's general strategy is? Is there an interpreter in the beginning before it does machine code? Like, what, what happens when it starts to look at that code? Well, um, it doesn't run on iOS. But uh, in general, what we do is we try to make the simple thing happen, which is we use the same compiler in multiple modes of optimization. One is uh, just unoptimized code. We basically read and scan the source code in, parse, and immediately generate code out of it. That code is instrumented to make, uh, make all these optimizations that I talked about uh, possible. So it collects the type feedback for all the, for all the calls. Depending on what, what calls there are, we actually collect feedback on the types of parameters so that we know this is not just a plus and a double, it's also a plus and a double with integer parameters all the time. So we can basically do the, do the upgrade to a double on the, on the fly there as well. All these kind of things uh, are collected in unoptimized code, what we call it. And then we basically, at some point, um, the VM decides this code is hot enough and will optimize it. And uh, as it optimizes further and further, it will start it doing more inlining and basically collects all these. You've taken this branch all the time. This, this else case is, a, is an unused. So we'll basically just not compile it at all. Cool. I think this is a question here for Dart for the web. Yeah. With a shift away from a VM in Chrome to compiling to JavaScript, have the metrics for success or the metrics for quality or the metrics for performance have changed? And uh, another way to ask this would be, we work with a lot of internal customers. What are the things that they're uh, important to them as a proxy for important to every developer? Yeah, I, I think this is right. I mean, and like, I, I didn't hear a lot of people um, you know, worried about Delta Blue performance yesterday. Um, it, but I, I do hear a lot of people talking about things like code size. So when I, when I look at the, the metrics for success, I, I really think that they're becoming more JavaScript-centric in a lot of ways. So we're talking about code size. It's really critical. We're talking about readability of code, and that's another really critical thing. We're talking about reusability of code. There are a bunch of metrics there. And in addition, the benchmarks that we're going to be running are going to be changing. I think you're going to be seeing the Dart for Web benchmarks moving to be much more web-centric and looking more like components that we want to be able to operate with a certain level of performance. And this is a related question here about Angular 2. If I parse mm -hmm. this correctly, I think we're asking from Angular.io, the website and the yeah. way Angular is being written, talk to me a little bit about where the relationship between TypeScript and Dart here. 
Yeah, so th this is, is an interesting question. I mean, if you visit Angular.io, it's actually really nice. You'll see that Dart and JavaScript are basically presented side by side for users. The fact that Angular um, is being written in TypeScript itself, I think, is not really that relevant. What's relevant is what kinds of interfaces they provide to Dart developers. And we have a number of internal users at Google that are that are really pushing on the Angular team to ensure that Angular Dart or Angular 2 Dart is just as nice to use as Angular 2.js. So I think that this is going to be a great story. You know, developers who are using Angular will be able to choose the language they want. To some extent, they're going to be able to mix and match things. So they'll be able to use Angular 2 components in an Angular 2 Dart app and vice versa. So I actually like the story a lot here. I, you know, we're, not a, we're not trying to dictate to people what they should be using, but we're about offering choices while still using the same framework. Cool, thanks. And again, we, if you want a question for the panel, please come up to the microphone. So I know Kenneth, I think what he's really asking here is, ES6, I hear, has a lot of things in it. Um, does it have all the things that Dart has? And I, I think this is actually really important because I do talk to a lot of developers who are like, ES6 is getting classes, so uh, Dart. But when I look under the covers, there's a ton going on in Dart and a lot more that I actually need and want. So this would be a good time to say, what are some of the things that Dart brings that ES6 isn't even touching? Or how do I evaluate the two? Mm -hmm. Lars. This will, of course, be a, a little bit of a color to answer. <laughs> But I like clear semantics, and uh, I think Dart has that. Uh, there's no implicit conversion of, of values like it is in JavaScript. And ES6 is still JavaScript. Nothing has changed. Libraries can still be, be manipulated on the fly, and rec composition uh, when you build up an application. So I, think, I still think that some of the uh, initial goals of, uh, of, of Dart uh, are still valid. Mm -hmm. and. Um, um, I don't want to make this sort of into a religious war, mm -hmm. um, but I still believe that we have a good set of batteries included in Dart, uh, which is adding classes uh, will not solve all problems in my mind. So um, I think Dart still has a lot to offer. And we can ask you guys, um, what do you think? <laughs> have you tried uh, ECMAScript 6? Any of you? Wow. Well, <laughs> oh, there's two guys. And um, what do you think? Uh, I, Dart makes them, um, Dart is more typeface, and so it gives you all the, the niceties of using um, the tooling around it. But using an script, or ES6 is still really flexible, and it's an improvement on JavaScript. But um, for making a large application, I still prefer Dart. Yeah. Cool. I, okay. I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can, can, moving can, on. Can, can you so, sum that up for the people who didn't, didn't oh, know? Yeah. It still, prefer, still prefers Dart. <laughs> yes, the audience still A++ plus 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 uh, would use Dart, Dart again. Yeah. I think uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the static types we have in Dart makes the programs readable. It makes it easier to maintain code. Um, a lot of program languages a, pro, a lot of program languages are easy to write uh, the, the, the code in the first time, but when you have to go back to the same piece of code two months later or a year later, you want to be able to understand what's going on. And I think in that scenario, that really has an advantage. Well said. Cool. Okay. We answered a bunch of the other questions, so I moved on, and we're almost out of time here. Oh, we have a live question. Great. Hey. Um, I know we talk a lot about the interoperability with JavaScript on the client side, but I'm wondering about bridging or other interoperability on the server side. I know that for the work that we do, uh, we have a lot of uh, required libraries and stuff that are built in you know, C Sharp or Java or something else that we have no choice. Um, I'm looking for ways to try to bring that in with a you know, Dart server. Is there any plans in that direction? You want? So currently, you can, if you if you're running on the, in a standalone VM, right, you can uh, embed C++ libraries or C libraries or any, any native libraries with a, just a shared object. So load that in, and you have basically some Dart interface that, that you can talk that way. Um, apart from <coughs> sorry, apart from that, maybe having some RPC service would help you. Uh, yeah. 
in general, it's about you know speed because we do a lot of you know heavy computation, you know, for satellite mission planning and okay. and control applications. So we do a lot of, you know, we get requests in from, you know, from the client and stuff, and we do a lot of work on it. And we want using an RPC service or some other you know standard protocol takes a lot of time to communicate that information around. Okay. So sometimes they provide us these libraries so that we can do a lot of it very fast. So just in the, the idea of maintaining as quick as we possibly can. Yeah, so it, basically it sounds like the, the embedding of a, of a shared library is more, more the kind of stuff that you would need, right? And um, you can import basically these libraries with a special prefix and the VM figures out that, oh, I need not just to load the Dart code, I also need to bind this shared library. And then you have a similar to a JNI API, um, but we try to make it a lot simpler than uh, using JNI. I'll, I'll ask you more after. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Question, yes. Hi. Have you considered adding support for algebraic data types or pattern matching into the language at all? <clears throat> I, I can take a short step at that one. We have considered a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's been a lot of requests for for many of these uh, advanced features. However, whenever we add a, an advanced feature, it gets harder to use the basic language. Uh, we designed Dart so it's easier to understand what's going on when you execute it. Uh, so when you're sitting inside a debugger, you take a single step, you know exactly what's going on. When you add these advanced features like uh, pattern matching, it gets a little bit more complicated to figure out what's going on at one time. Um, of course, if there's not enough requests for it, we will certainly look at it and put it in. We have a process called the debt process where everybody can add a proposal and send it in to us and we will look at it and, and put it in if it's, uh, if it's good for the language. However, um, whenever we add something to a programming language, it gets more complicated. And I really believe that uh, if you have a simple execution in, in, uh, in, uh, in your programming language, then we'll, people will understand what's going on and they'll be more productive. So that's the balance we have to consider. Thank awesome, you. good way to end it. And with that, we're out of time. So thank you for everyone who voted and asked questions. Ask questions here. Let's thank our panelists. We'll see you after the break. <laughs>